Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 526, featuring an interview with Mr. Jeremy Parrish. And uh, you may have come across Jeremy's work before. Uh, probably, I'd say definitely if you're a fan of retro stuff, because he's uh, done the Retro Knots podcast, he's done his own video work series here on YouTube. Uh, before that, he's done his One Up, uh, doing all sorts of great writings about. Uh, video games, especially retro stuff. He's been around. He's got lots and lots of great stories, uh, really insightful perspectives on uh, the industry and the history uh, and journalism and much, much more. Uh, we had a great conversation. Uh, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jeremy Parrish. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, great. So, yeah. So you say they're doing a little construction work over at your place. Yeah, they had to replace the kitchen backsplash and the uh, vent hood in the kitchen. So that was supposed to have been taken care of yesterday, but it was not. So it sounds like they're, they've are they pretty much wrapped up for the day, but there may be some power tools in the background. Do I sound okay? I'm still getting used to this new mixing board that I picked up. Uh, hopefully it sounds okay. It's the always upgrading, always updating. Uh, it's not so much an upgrade as my previous one died. And uh, yeah, the sound quality was uh, not good. So I had to replace it. I would rather not have spent money on more equipment, but mm -hmm. sometimes you just gotta. Takes money to make money. Yep, or even to break even. I'm glad I live uh, in a place with a basement sometimes because i can record down here like if i was trying to record upstairs i don't know what it sounds like a hurricane up there i <laughs> mean windows rattling yeah um i'm what? actually on the top floor in my home office and the kitchen is uh down on the first floor but i was still getting quite a bit of sound bleed through from the doors so that's just the nature of things is that where you do all your recording for your podcasts and videos and uh stuff? yeah now that i've now that i've relocated and have working equipment. Uh, if I record at home, it's always up here. Excellent. Well, yeah, I've been having a great time, Jeremy, with all your stuff. I, I mean, appreciate it. Just show a little bit of it. I mean, obviously, we're not going to get to everything you've done here because that would take about 50 years. Now, what is this? <laughs> oh, okay. So you can see <laughs> you got these yep, can... pop ups from Zoom all of a sudden. Yeah, I clicked OK that it's fine that it's recording, but uh, that's oh, well, hopefully. Zoom. Every, everything loves pop-ups these days. It'll be a very short video for not actually recording, so hopefully that's working. Oh, so this is a video? Yes, yeah, video. Oh, do I need to move this to the side so you can actually see my face? Well, I wasn't going to say anything. I thought maybe that was your thing. I mean, you want to uh, no, it's just, you know, <laughs> to minimize Land pops. Massive. The man behind the mic, literally, literally behind. Uh, but yeah, you've got uh, all sorts of stuff, and I'm pretty sure my people that watch my channel are familiar with with you. <laughs> so, uh, if not, wow, they're going to be prepared to have your mind blown. <laughs> yeah, I mean, video works. This is probably one of your more recent things, right? The uh, YouTube. Uh, I remember you from like One Up. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, I got all these links here. <laughs> <laughs> so books, <laughs> uh, of course, retro knots uh, yep. podcasts. Yeah, I've listen. been less involved with retro knots lately than I would like, just because of all the stuff going on in my personal life. But uh, mm -hmm. as things are settling down a bit, I'm hoping that I can get back into the groove of podcasting more. So that'll be good. Yeah, there's six. Well, six hundred is a nice number. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah we're we're up into the six hundreds, like... and that's that's not including the. Uh, the episodes we recorded under the auspices of one up actually so it's actually somewhere in the 700s uh in terms of you know since 2006 so it's a lot of podcasts yeah it's, it's i found several lists of like what are your top 10 favorite retro knots episodes you know the people talk about that and I, the one that came up the that i saw most often was i think episode 320 which was a um, Metroidvania thing. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know the the episode numbers off the top of my head, <laughs> no, given how many there are. <laughs> you oh, do you have a favorite one that? Mr. Do I personally have a favorite one. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know. There, there are there are quite a few that I feel came out pretty well. Um, we did a Pokemon, we did a Blue episode right after the pandemic uh, kind of started to settle down a little bit, and we could record in person. I thought that was great. Um, there was, let's see, what else? Um, you know, I've done some interviewed episodes with with game developers. Um, I don't know that those are necessarily anyone's favorites, but I'm always really happy with those, really proud of them. Uh, like, you know, interviewing Robert Woodhead about uh, wizardry and, and things like that. Like, um, yeah, I love those opportunities to go out and just get insights from developers, people who were there in the industry. I'm actually interviewing tomorrow. I'm, I'm going up to Chicago to do some makeup recording. I had to miss Midwest Gaming Classic. Uh, so I'm doing some makeup recording tomorrow and talking to Mark Flitman, who was a producer at Konami, Acclaim, Midway, uh, a bunch of really big companies back in the late 80s, all through the 90s. Um, talking about a book he published with us at Limited Run and just about his career. And um, that sounds awesome. Yeah, just a, it's a different perspective. Usually, when you talk to people, it's like the lead designer in a game. He was a producer as opposed to a designer. So his work was more of kind of like the, the high level organizing and funding things and just kind of managing tasks and uh, providing feedback and uh, just kind of making sure that things hit schedules and timelines. So kind of a thankless job. Uh, but I, I thought his book, which was kind of a memoir and kind of a, a how-to, uh, is, is really an interesting insight into game development, just because it's 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 from a perspective that you don't see represented very often in uh, games books. Like not everyone is a John Romero and actually there are very few John Romeros in the world. And there are many more people who do kind of the, the sort of nuts and bolts work of making games and they don't really write books. They don't, you know, offer memoirs. So having, having that perspective, I think is, is pretty valuable. Oh yeah, there you go, right there. It's not all fun and games. Uh, and Mark's a really nice guy, so I'm looking forward to meeting with him again. I went up to his place a few years ago to do the photography for this book and just kind of get to know him and uh, kick out, kick around ideas about uh, the book and the direction it should go. Um, so it'll be it'll be good to connect with him. We were supposed to connect at Midwest Gaming Classic this year, which didn't happen because of a, an emergency. I had to leave at the last second. Hmm. Um, Last year, I was supposed to meet with him, but I got COVID, so I couldn't go to Midwest Gaming Classic. So uh, it's, you know, it's just been a comedy of errors. So it'll be nice to actually uh, get that settled back into, you know, kind of working order again. I'm excited for you. Oh, yeah, I've, heard this, I've heard that role described as the person who has to say no to people. The producer role? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saying no oh, and saying, why aren't you doing better? Uh, like, yeah, it's not a, it's not an easy position. I imagine it's not something I would want to do. I like actually, you know, having my hands on things and creating stuff and just kind of going my own direction. I really hate managing. So God bless the people who do it. Cause it's not for me. Yeah. I wanted to show your, uh, your Patreon page as well. Oh yeah. There we go. <laughs> so you've done it all i mean you've you've written about games you've made podcasts you've done videos probably even played. i haven't actually made a game so you haven't made a game did i say that i said that I've... no no i'm saying that that's like the one thing i haven't done but yeah i um you know i i launched my own if you want to get back to the the really the early origins launched my own website and like 1996 just some sad little thing on geocities and eventually <laughs> just through posting on message board forums and stuff got involved with a new site being launched called the gaming intelligence agency in 1998 uh, that launched the same week that zelda ocarina of time came out that's how long ago it was nice. um and that kind of snowballed you know i had the connections there met you know made friends on the site um 
they you know sent me some freelance work i wrote a couple of strategy guides for GameSpot back when people actually paid a lot of money for strategy guides and then the dot-com bubble burst and that all went away but then a few years later um, a contact from the gia said hey we're starting up this new website with the ziff davis magazines uh, we need some graphic designers would you be interested and i said yes i'm unemployed so that sounds great so i went out interviewed got the job moved to san francisco and uh, became officially part of the games industry as it were um how, and how, eventually how old were you during this time how old was i uh, i was kind of an old man by by relative terms i was what like 28 or so when i started in the games press so I hope that's not old <laughs> uh i mean compared to a lot of the people who were in the press at the time they were all like wow you're old um I mean, one up was being run by Sam Kennedy, who was probably in his very early twenties at that point. He was kind of the wunderkind, and uh, they gave him, you know, gave him management duties for one up. You know, at, at at for a while we had Patrick Patrick Klepek writing. I think he was still a teen when he was writing for us, like in this eighteen or nineteen or so when he started. I don't think he could actually legally get into E three. The first time we took him to E3, I could be misremembering some of this. So, you know, I, I don't want to misrepresent to... Patrick as a criminal, but, um, you, I'm, you know, there. yeah, like, you know, at the time uh, I was, I was pretty old compared to uh, the people working on the site. And then, you know, you had the people on the magazine side who were maybe a few years older than me, but they'd been in the press for years you know jeff folks like jeff green and james milky um you know they were seasoned veterans uh, i was just like some nobody uh coming into my late 20s so um yeah i definitely felt a little uh, you know just a little outside the norm for the games journalism cycle but i guess that kind of worked to my advantage because um when one up first launched it had you know platform sections, GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, handheld, and retro. And no one was writing anything for retro. So I was like, all right, I'll take over this side. I'm supposed to be doing graphic design, but that doesn't take all day. So I'll just, you know, throw articles on here. And, um, you know, it was content for the site. I don't know if it was any good, but it was there. And a few years later, when people started kicking around the idea of making podcasts, uh, every publication kind of had its own podcast, you know, all the different magazines and so forth. And I said, well, we could do one for retro gaming. And I came up with a temporary name, Retronauts, uh, and said this will probably last about three episodes. <laughs> and, you know, people actually seemed to like it. I mean, this was still a very raw era of, of the Internet. So mostly people just complained about it. But, you know, the numbers were pretty good. So we just kept doing it. And um Complained about the name? Or the Com oh, no, complained about the podcast. Complained about anything we did. Awesome name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so were they just complaining about what? The, really? uh, you know, like these people are bad at podcasting. They have stupid opinions. Their voices are annoying. Oh. You know, just, just the usual. Um, I feel like this was, you know, kind of before there was sort of a winnowing of good game enthusiasts and bad game enthusiasts and now the bad game enthusiasts kind of they're they're sort of sequestered in their own horrible little dink spaces of the internet most of which are walled off yeah. so they can't be searched and you know they're they're out there doing their takedown campaigns and doxing and so forth but but on the whole i actually find at least for me um the internet is a much kinder and more pleasant space to create on than it was 15 years ago. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know if that's the consensus, but I seem like most people I talk to feel like it's the other way around, but hmm. I'm more like you. <laughs> I feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like one, the gaming press and just gaming space in general is a lot more inclusive. When I started in the press, it was pretty much just white dudes. Uh, I was just one one white face in the sea of many white faces. And anyone who didn't kind of fit into that category was pretty unusual. And now there's much more variety of voices and experiences and backgrounds in, in games journalism. And there's not there, there aren't as many games journalism outlets in the traditional sense, but 
um, there are more opportunities for people who want to create and have their voices heard to do that just you know maybe outside the mainstream but even in the mainstream press you just see a lot of you know just a lot of um, really welcome diversity and and interesting opinions um, and I do feel like that has elicited some toxicity and negativity and there's no denying that people who do look different than me and have a different background than me do, you know they take it on the chin a lot more than i do so i don't want to speak for them right. because you know different backgrounds and different present day opinion, uh, experiences but you know the fact that there are those opportunities at all to me says that we are in a better place and you know i, I think the involvement of of uh, more women more people of color more people in the queer community it's just made the conversations around video games better and brought more insight into things. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad for it. I feel like people are saying more interesting things about video games than when I first started writing about video games, where it was pretty much just, you know, the hype cycle. And there wasn't much outside, much room outside of, you know, kind of like the sort of marketing driven uh, mainstream uh, video game perspective and you know there's there's more outside of the mainstream of video games these days to begin with you know the indie scene didn't exist in the early 2000s uh, it was you know some shareware but that was pretty much it um, so gaming and uh, gaming coverage as a whole I think are in in a better place as long as you kind of look past the the big budget mainstream type things that are choking out other games through you know subscriptions and dlc and games as a service and that kind of thing like i don't think that's necessarily a healthy space to be but everything kind of on the periphery is uh, it's just great to see I, I like where gaming is these days we had a question that was about the about Ziff davis when you first started there sure and they were asking about when you started there, did you want to write, or did you originally want to write for the magazine or for a magazine instead of the for the web? And then was writing for an online outlet looked down on, looked down upon at the time compared to the magazines. Yes and yes. I mean, I took the job that I could get, and it was welcome, and it was you know an entry level position in the you know, something adjacent to the games industry. So that was exciting. I got to live in San Francisco uh, back at a time where it was still kind of bouncing back from the dot-com boom. So it was, or the dot-com crash. So it was actually affordable to live there for a little while. Um, yeah, like I, it was a great opportunity, but the entire time I was at Ziff Davis, I was, you know, freelancing for the magazines, contributing to the magazines. And I always had my eye on the magazines. And eventually I did start getting solicitations from, you know, Electronic Gaming Monthly. Uh, they were like, hey, you want to be the reviews editor? And I said, whoa, I, you know, I grew up reading EGM reviews, like back in the NES, Super NES days. I, you know, even it, I would buy EGM or if I couldn't afford it, I just flipped through it in the magazine, the magazine racks. That sounds amazing. But cooler heads prevailed and said you actually don't want to be on a magazine right now because they're probably not going to be around in a year and that person was correct and i weathered the storm by sticking it out at oneup.com uh, and working online so yeah it was kind of like the the dream that never could be um and it's ultimately just as well but it, it was kind of a bummer um to have you know that cool opportunity dangled in front of me and have to say, oh, it's just not the right choice for me right now. Um, so yeah, there was that aspect of it. And yes, initially um, the magazine people looked at the website people and just kind of saw us as, I think there was a lot of view that we were sort of freeloading, maybe a little bit parasitic. Um, it definitely wasn't taken seriously when one up first started and for the first couple of years, uh, because, you know, we had the sort of radical idea of 
once a magazine has been out for a while and people have picked it up at the newsstands and read their subscriptions, let's start putting some of that content online for people to read. And there was, I think, some some you know some saltiness around the fact that we were just scraping their content and putting it online but you know eventually that became kind of the standard you know I, I think publications like wired really kind of helped push that into the mainstream uh, but it was it was an uphill battle um, for sure and there was a lot of misunderstanding about what we wanted to do with the website and what we needed to do and you know the the resentment works both ways. We would go to E3, and the website people were there, busting their asses for four days, five days, filing a dozen stories a day, more than that sometimes, and just killing ourselves to get as much coverage up as quickly as possible, drive that traffic. The magazine guys would go, they'd take some meetings, they'd have their interview with Miyamoto. And, you know, the show closed, it was time to go to the parties and have some drinks and, you know, they'd go back to San Francisco the next week, have a few days to kind of relax, and then they'd start working on the magazine and do all their E3 coverage. You know, they, 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 had, they had it kind of easy. Uh, whereas I've never had an E3 where I was not sweating and just busting my ass. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, like I said, there was there was a culture clash in both directions. But after a few years, um, it, people kind of started to see that the you know which way the wind was blowing, and there was a lot more integration between the website and the magazines. And you know, I think once people started working kind of across the publications, contributing content to different publications, different magazines, and to the website. Um, it kind of broke the barriers down. And, um, you know, I think after a while they saw the magazine people or the, the website people could be valuable contributors to the magazines and vice versa. So, um, you know, there was, there was detente, let's say. It just took a little while. <laughs> I've got a lot of nostalgia for those old magazines. I, I feel like you do too. It's one, I, one of the things I like about your videos is I was watching the one about you know, Ultima exodus on the nes and you, you talked about how there was a 10 page spread and nintendo power about the about the game and i thought yeah that's an important part of the story of the game yeah uh, um that's just, yeah it's part of the context right is what was it is yeah and I've, I've increasingly shifted to a model with my videos where i'm sort of telling the story around the game yeah. there might be a few minutes of coverage of here is the video game and how it works but uh, we're kind of getting to a point in the NES chronology, 1989, where, you know, genres are starting to become pretty well defined. So I don't need to relitigate how a platform action game works every time. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers was there four years earlier. There have been lots of reactions to it. We can talk about how something builds on it or what it does differently. But, you know, a lot of what makes these games interesting and you know, kind of uh, kind of explains why they're held in such high esteem is that there is this sort of surrounding cultural context. And that's something that's largely vanished and absent from mm -hmm. conversations about games when you're talking with people who discovered them through emulation years later or discovered them through retro compilations or, you know, or at swap meets and pick up some cartridges and are like, oh, I'm going to, you know, play this game on my grandfather's Nintendo system, which, you know, it's a, it's like a dagger to the heart, but okay, fair enough. Um, you know, I'm that old. It's fine. Um, but, you know, as someone who was there really spending way too much time thinking about this stuff and following it, you know, like I said, thumbing through EGM on the newsstand had a Nintendo power subscription. I do feel like I, I have that sort of first person insight not into how the games were made. I wasn't there doing that. I was just a kid playing them. But, you know, how were these games received? How were they covered? How were they presented? And it's been kind of educational for me because I think back and I'm like, wow, I used to beat, just like destroy NES games on the regular. I was so good at video games. But as I've been going through Nintendo Power, I'm like, oh, I was able to do that because I had the subscription and they hold your hand through the whole damn thing. Like Dragon Warrior, 
I was like, man, you know, RPGs were just a natural thing for me. I was so good at video games. I just picked up Dragon Warrior and, and annihilated it. Well, no, Dragon Warrior was explained completely, like to the last second of the game, not only in its manual, but also in multiple Nintendo Power features, you know, like they they just laid that game open. They They, you know, exposed it and showed you all of its nuts and bolts and told you exactly how you should play it. It was really, I mean, this is kind of the point I made in my video on the game. It really was presented as baby's first RPG. And not only is it, you know, a simple take on the role-playing game designed for newcomers to the genre, but, you know, Nintendo of America really, really approached it that way in terms of marketing and coverage. And, so, you know, it's been a little bit humbling to realize, oh, I'm not actually as great at video games as I remembered being, but at the same time, I think that's, you know, valuable insight and, and kind of um, a great realization to see how games were sold when the industry was still kind of building itself up, up from not quite nothing, but definitely from the ashes of something that had come before. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that myself. I think I'm probably guilty of the same thing, feeling like I'm better and forgetting that I actually had a lot of help. <laughs> yeah, I had a couple of guys on on the, some previous programs that wrote strategy guys, uh, some mm -hmm. of the Prima books and so on. And yeah, they were, uh, uh, I guess, kind of, I don't know if nostalgic is the right word, but they kind of felt like something got lost. Uh, when those guides become became kind of untenable because it was like an art form and they put a lot of effort into those books but you know then they got uh, once the internet came along then you could just hop on a wiki or whatever and find the the solutions you know there were less demand for for their work yeah i mean i i definitely share some of that i used to buy lots of strategy guides for the games i was playing uh, i still have a bunch at the office um and you know, from time to time, I do like to work on strategy guides. Um, I put together, I didn't write it, but I, I laid it out, which was a monumental undertaking, a strategy guide for Axiom Verge 1 and 2. Uh, and that was that was humbling because I thought, oh, I love these games. I've beaten them. I know them inside and out. It's all good. But actually sitting down to organize two vast nonlinear action games in a way that is cohesive and coherent. Um, that was, that was kind of brutal. Uh, but you know, the, the guide sold a few thousand copies. Obviously that's not up to the standards of, you know, back in the day when they were selling tens of thousands of copies, how many copies of Ocarina of Time guides do you think Prima sold? I can't even begin to guess. Maybe a hundred thousand. Who knows? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a niche market at this point. But it's yeah, it's it's enjoyable. I'm I'm actually working on a couple of strategy guides, either writing or laying out. Um, actually, several uh, for things that have not been announced, so I can't talk about those. Um, but yes, um, they're good to do as like pack-in content for mm -hmm. collectors' editions of games at limited run. Um, so that's, that's something I enjoy doing. I can't do too many of those because they're very time consuming, but, um, you know, it's, it's kind of trying to keep the, the, the torch burning a little bit. You know, sometimes I feel kind of, kind of weird. Cause when I was a kid, I loved the, I'd get a, like these gold box games, Bard's tell something like that. And I'd spend as probably as much time looking at the manuals and the strategy guides and <laughs> all that sort of, all that sort of thing. Enjoyed that almost as much as the game. Yeah, hang on. Let me see. I think I think there is something that we have announced, um, and maybe I'm gonna make a little news. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, we've only announced that it's coming. I can't actually talk about the strategy guide that I'm going to be including in it. So that's as much of a teaser as I can offer. But I will say that I am taking for this guide that I'm building uh, the Nintendo Power approach and building maps out of screenshots, oh, Okay, which wow. is uh, even that's actually more challenging than I realized because, um, you know, if it's not just like a linear game where it's just scrolling left or right, you actually have to do a lot of kind of surgery to stitch these things together. So 
you know, I keep I keep biting off more than I can chew with projects, but it's kind of fun just to um, to get in a little bit over my head, uh, like I did with Axiom Verge and now with this this other guy that I'm working on, and say, wow, I really have to think about what I'm doing, and I really have to uh, be smart about it so that I can actually get this done on the deadline that I need to hit. Um, so yeah, it's a what I think you said you started working on. in print, but with an online scheduling mentality. You started as a graphic designer. Did I hear that? I did. Yeah, actually, that's my that's my degree. Okay. Um, but I got into doing graphic design work and realized, oh, this isn't actually any fun because I'm not working on cool, fun projects. I'm making advertisements for a local newspaper, and the person who sells all the ads is like in her sixties and has a very old school approach, and her clients and she herself really don't want me to do anything interesting with design. They want me to put together this massive car ad for the Sunday edition that's just like, you know, stock images of 50 different cars with a tiny little MSRP tax title and license and a price next to every single one. There's no room for creativity. So, uh, Oh, yeah, I actually I started at one up doing graphic design, but um, even that was kind of limiting because I, you know, the website is designed, I was just putting together like thumbnail images for articles, basically. And um, I, I think, you know, after I had been plugging away at the retro section and the, the handheld section contributing articles there, um, the editorial team was like, actually, He's probably going to do more good for us doing editorial than than graphic design. So it was, uh, you know, they they gave me the opportunity to move to a different position, which was, uh, you know, a great opportunity that I'm super grateful for. It came with a raise, which was nice, uh, but also it just came with more freedom for me to do interesting things. And you know, I um, still had to do graphic design stuff, like I would put together the images and screenshots and stuff for my own articles. So. Um, that's kind of what I do now is like, you know, I, I do a lot of podcasts and videos and that's more as a matter of pragmatism. What I really love making are the books that, you know, the videos I create actually feed into. But I realize that there's not a living to be made just making books about old video games. So, um, Oh, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> I'm afraid, I'm afraid it's true. Um, you know, in a perfect world, all of those would be sold out. But here we are um, in the reality where they are not sold out. So, uh, no, the the videos, like, I've, I've really kind of gotten a handle on making podcasts and videos, which were totally outside my experience when I first started. And uh, I think you can really see if you go back to the videos I was making 10 years ago, they were, they were rough. Um, mm. The audio, the editing, the video quality the pacing, everything. Um, and, you know, you keep doing something long enough every week. Eventually, you become very competent at it. Yeah, I saw those, the, one of your videos you were talking about the, uh, I think it was your Game Boy series. And you're talking about some of the challenges that mm -hmm. you've had with that. And and we you're just talking there about how hard it would be to capture videos and you know, work on a script and things of that sort. You know, I've had that, uh, certainly had that experience. When I started this channel, the videos, YouTube was limiting the video size to something like five to 10 minutes long. But mm -hmm. it, yeah, back in the old days. When I was really trying to do a good job like you do, it would take me, you know, two or three days to make a little 10 minute video just in time, times of the editing and the research and the scripting and all that. And, you know, I don't know. That's why. I'm kind of glad I went through that so I can have more appreciation when I see videos like yours and I know what, what went into that. <laughs> you know, I wonder how many people that just casually watch a video think, oh, well, that was 10 minutes. You know, that was easy. Yeah, I mean, um, I, have no I, I spend a lot of time working on my videos. I've, I've gotten much faster at creating them than I was at the start. It used to be like for every minute of footage that you saw or every minute of video, it took like an hour or more of editing. And that was not even including the video capture and the uh, the scripting and everything. Um, I've gotten a lot faster with the editing, uh, but you know, writing and recording and just 
putting together a video uh, it's it's not quite a full-time job but it takes up a lot of time you know in my mornings before i go to work uh in the evenings and uh, especially on the weekends uh, it's it's very involved but uh it's it's also the videos specifically just that that project of creating the videos and then sort of funneling them into books um that's it's something i just really love it's um yeah i just i really enjoy it i think you know it's um What's your something favorite? that i'm kind of doing on my own terms and there's been a lot of support for it which is nice just you know from kind of all levels from you know video viewers to patrons to even my boss at work at limited run uh was a, a fan of my videos that's how he got to know me in my books so he was like yeah come work here um so you know it, it it's it's a good feeling to do that but also i just feel like when i first started the videos there was kind of a sense of what's the point here but now that i have 10 years of weekly videos that are you know, kind of something you can sit down and watch over a long period of time. I, I think the the kind of idea I had of putting together a timeline of, of, of history and, and trying to pull in as much context as possible um, is starting to come together. That's, you know, kind of taking the long, the long term approach, the 10 year plan. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's very satisfying to pull each video together. And it's also even more satisfying to take all of that material and rework it into a book and finally hold that book in my hands and say, ah, here it is. It's, you know, it's complete and it's awesome. Hmm. I was going to ask you, what's your favorite book? <laughs> what's Of your books, which one do you like the best? Uh, you know, the one I'm most proud of is the one that, what's that? But you got so many to choose from. I mean, which? Yeah, I only have a few in print right now. The the earlier books were, they're pretty rough and they're out of print for a reason. Oh. Um, but the the current ones, which are NES Works nineteen eighty five eighty six, NES Works eighty seven, Super NES Works Volume One, Virtual Boy Works, and SG one thousand Works. So of all of those, SG one thousand Works is the one I'm most proud of, um, because I feel like it involved the most work in terms of the layout in terms of the writing and editing and also it's a topic that no one else has covered in this degree right. of of completeness um and it's not a topic that a lot of people are interested in <laughs> honestly uh this this book's not selling all that well but i kind of knew that going in like I would like for it eventually to become profitable so that they're not mad at me at work. But, um, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's, um, I, I feel like with this one, I really made a contribution to, um, documenting video game history that no one else, um, has or will attempt to do with this degree of, of comprehensiveness. So, you know, not a lot of people care about the SG-1000 because it wasn't released here in the U.S. and it only had sort of limited reach into Europe and Australia. And Sega of Japan probably doesn't want us distributing this book in Japan for various like licensing reasons. So it's kind of missing its target audience, not that it's in Japanese anyway. Um, but, you know, as far as really deep dives into an esoteric corner of video game history go uh you're you know it's going to be hard to find something better than than that book i genuinely feel that but you know now now my goal is to create a book of that level of quality for design layout text that's about something people care about so that's my next project yeah and i, I know exactly that that tension you're talking about because you know even making videos I'm like, why do I want to make a video about a game that everybody's intimately familiar with? They, they know the story. What can I add? I can't add to that. You know, there's nothing I can add to this. And whereas I could do this more obscure game that maybe a lot of people haven't even heard of. <laughs> you know, I like that better myself. But yeah, it's it's always that struggle. Of, well, if nobody cares about it. <laughs> why yeah, would I and that's on my video. That's one of the reasons I've I've kind of given up on my 
long ago dream of covering every Game Boy release all around the world because no one is really interested in reading about a card game that was only released in Japan or, you know, a, a horse racing game or something like that. Like, you know, those, those videos would get just tiny views and um, some of that stuff has gotten really expensive. So there's no, there's no value in it. So really I'm, I'm focused on just covering sort of basically the American video games industry from the point that Nintendo launched the NES and, you know, kind of everything that happened from there. Obviously, I'm not going to reach the present day in my lifetime. I might be able to reach the end of the NES library and maybe, maybe even get to the N64 uh, chronologically by the time I die. But it's, it's kind of slow going and that's fine. Um, and then, you know, I do like to take the side excursions into the more esoteric things, specifically consoles that shipped in Japan before the NES launched here. It's kind of like, you know, people know about the Atari era and television and so forth, but there's not a lot of transparency and awareness in the West of what Nintendo was kind of up against. Like, yes, the Nintendo Famicom NES was was the dominant system, but what else was out there? Like, what, what was competing with it? Well, I've covered the SG-1000. Uh, I've put together a complete video series on the Epoch Cassette Vision and the Gokken TV Boy at this point. And there's still other systems for me to talk about, which, you know, the games aren't necessarily great, but it's interesting to see like, hey, here's what, you know, what consumers in Japan had to pick from besides NES. And I think ultimately I'm creating a body of work that mostly just shows like, whoa, the NES really kicked a lot of ass. It was, it was an amazing system for the time. No wonder it did well. I always wondered that myself. I think you should do those. <laughs> was it the, the what was the cassette vision? Mm -hmm. I no, I no, the videos are all on my channel, like the entire oh. cassette vision. Um, and I'm publishing publicly the last of the Gakken TV Boy Gokken TV, videos this Gokken weekend. TV Boy. Okay. Gakken TV Boy launched in October 1983, uh, disappeared from the market about the same time. Six games were released for it on launch day, and that's all it was released. It's got a handle on it. Like the joystick looks like a, a kind of like a steering handle. And then it's got another handle on it. That's not an interactive element. It's just something you hold on to and grip the console because the joystick is integrated into it. It's a weird system. It's basically a Tandy Coco. Oh, oh, um, it's, it's, it's a really weird system. And it was, it was really fun to cover it because, you know, I, I had it. Um, is that it? Oh, there you go. That's it. That's the Gokken TV boy. <laughs> uh, a three a three episode series. Last episode is going up this weekend. Um, I've got a but part of you. Yeah, it was it was it was fun to cover this just because tracking down all the games was really hard uh, and actually cost a lot of money. Um, and then I had the system modified so it would output uh, composite video instead of trying to run on Japanese RF frequencies, which aren't compatible with American TVs. So that allowed me to record footage from the actual console. And then just trying to piece together, like, what were they thinking? Who are these Gokken people anyway? Why did they do this? How did this happen? So yeah, it was a fun little exercise. Yeah, I was going to ask you another question along those lines about you just, you've been talking about how it could be expensive to acquire some of these games and and I think it was the the Game Boy video, and you were saying that you wanted to have a complete, you know, thing, but it was getting to the point where the collectors were, the collectors are driving up the prices. I guess you kind of gotten into it because you thought this would be cheaper. <laughs> than yeah, that system. But by the end of it, it became you know prohibitively expensive, and you had to even start a Patreon page <laughs> just to make it feasible. Well, no, the, the Patreon was was kind of always there from the start just to like justify the time that I spend on this stuff. Uh, because when I started doing this, I was still in the games press. And let me tell you, there's not a lot of money there, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're working for a British company like I was. And they're like, oh, we don't need to give you healthcare money because that's taken care of, right? Well, no, actually things work kind of differently in America. It's kind of bad over here. Um, no, the... Um, you know, I'm not a collector myself. Like I, I have games that I want to keep. 
Um, but basically what I want to do is create high quality photography of game boxes, cartridges, manuals, etc. cetera. Um, I don't have a problem with borrowing games or going to someone's house to photograph their collection, but it's kind of a big imposition. That's a lot to ask. So I'm reluctant to do it to just like randomly go out and say, Hey, can I, can I borrow your expensive rare video games? Do you mind if I put my hands all over them, touch them and photograph them so that I can make some money? Like, it's not a good, it's, it's not a persuasive argument, a compelling request, in my opinion. And I have been fortunate in that some of my friends uh, have been generous about letting me shoot some of their stuff. Like, I, I went to Chris Kohler's place uh, a couple of times to photograph stuff for a book that he's publishing. And while I was there, he was like, oh, hey, you should shoot, you know, Power Blade 2 and... Uh, you know, some of these super rare late NES games. So I do have good photography of some of these games. I don't have to buy them now. Uh, Steve Lynn, who is a friend of collectors, you know, is a part of the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, let me spend an afternoon at his house just photographing his mostly complete American Turbo Graphics collection. And, you know, there were some limitations there. He didn't have all the games. Some of the games were sealed and we didn't want to open them. But I photographed like 85% of the TurboGrafx library. That saved me tens of thousands of dollars. I am more than happy to do that. But at the same time, I hate to impose on people. So, you know, it's kind of this uh, little bit of a conundrum. So, yeah, I was, I was priced out of doing the worldwide Game Boy set because when I first started, like no one cared about collecting Game Boy 10 years ago. It was kind of, you know out in the the boondocks of video game collecting and especially the japanese stuff like no one cared. but then i think people started to say oh well i've got all the nes games and super nes games and virtual boy games and n64 games i should do game boy next so collectors started snatching stuff up the really rare games became even rarer and people started hunting for interesting games from japan so all of a sudden those became much more expensive um you know when i first started there were very few complete in box game boy games that would would sell for more than 50 bucks on ebay and even fewer that would sell for more than a hundred um but now like the going price for most game boy games if you want to get them complete and in decent condition is at least a hundred dollars mm -hmm. um it's just, it's skyrocketed in price. It's funny because the super rare stuff, super expensive stuff hasn't gone up in price. Like when I first started doing this, Sumo Fighter and Fish Dude uh, for Game Boy were both in the eight to $900 range. And they're still in the eight to $900 range. It's been um, some of the other stuff that's that's just skyrocketed. Like Kid Dracula was probably $250, $300 when I started doing this and now, uh, if you look at price charting, that's going to be, uh, I think it was complete in boxes closing in on five or six thousand dollars. I saw it, I saw it a few years back at a convention complete in box for nine hundred ninety nine dollars and thought, wow, that's ridiculous. But that would have been a steal if I had gotten it then compared to what it is now. So, yeah, some of the some of the more prized items especially those attached to franchises that people love like castlevania mega man mario those are definitely going up in price and they're just they're they're inaccessible so you know i had to just kind of pare it back to just the american stuff because i i can actually find people who have american games when you get into like the really esoteric expensive japanese stuff who who has a complete Japanese Game Boy collection? Where am I going to find that? It's just, it's not an option. So yeah, that's like the, the cost logistics of things um, have really kind of bedeviled me. Um, so it doesn't help that uh, my wife and I moved to a new house. We needed more space for our home offices and also for family that's staying with us sometimes so uh that's a more expensive mortgage because you know right mortgages are a lot more expensive than they were 10 years ago when we bought our first house so uh yeah you know just everything is more expensive now so i've had to kind of strategize how i'm approaching making these videos and books and i do think borrowing will factor in a lot 
and you know i i know people who are very generous and and kind and supportive um and they're happy to let me photograph the things that i need in terms of capturing video uh there are many many options that don't necessarily require original cartridges let's say and uh, still let you record on you know like play the games on original hardware or really good clone hardware but um Fortunately, the video capture is not not that difficult. It's just the photography. But, you know, having those big, clear, crisp images of game packages in print, like that's something that is pretty. It's I'm not the only one who's doing that, but it's it's uh, really it's just me and Bitmap Books, and Bitmap Books is very specific about what they do. Like they're not interested in doing, say, the complete Game Boy chronology. Their Game Boy book was just kind of like what the editor thought was interesting. So it's a it's kind of a grab bag. It's mm. it's an unusual uh, an un, unusual lineup of games in their book, which you know there's value in that too. It's like here's the big stuff, but also here's some of the kind of weird offbeat stuff. Uh, but I really you know with NES works, Game Boy works, etc., really want to tackle everything. And, um, you know, the SG-1000 Works book is complete. It's every game for SG-1000. Virtual Boy Works is complete. It's every game for Virtual Boy. And thankfully, Chris Kohler was kind enough to let me photograph his four, uh, the four Heavenly Kings, I call them, the games that may only have been produced in triple-digit quantities. We don't know, but they're vastly more expensive than anyone should ever consider paying for a video game, if you can even find them. Yeah, I wonder. I've noticed these prices going up too, and that's one reason I switched into computer games. And I was thinking I could get those for cheaper, but even those have gone up. And I wonder is this going to just is going to hit a bubble? Or is this just going to just continue to become more and more valuable? And <laughs> I'm I'm not good at predicting anything to do with money. Um, <laughs> so I just think it's about a real comics. weakness for me. No. Yeah, so I think. I think comic books kind of buried themselves. I, you know, the the sort of meaningful books will always be valuable. First appearance of sure. X character, that kind of thing. Uh, and I, I think video games will kind of go the same way. I think we're going to plateau. I think maybe we've already plateaued and prices are starting to stagnate or even fall in some respects. But the meaningful games will just keep going up and up and up. The The games like Super Mario Brothers or, you know, I I guess people aren't as big into collecting Sega, but I feel like at some point Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, there's going to be some stuff that skyrockets there. Nice. Um, it's those those games that, you know, have not only a personal connection to people, but also significance in history. Um, those will continue to go up in price. And, you know, I think some of the prices on things like Ocarina of Time that you see in headlines are, are just ridiculous because how many millions of copies of that game did they make? It's not like even the gold cartridge with the lenticular cover. It's not that rare, but you know, it's a uh, kind of the hype around it. People, people want their complete Zelda collections, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That, well, that's, that's not too bad, but it's a gray cart. Yeah, I've heard that there's even counterfeits. Oh, probably. Going around. I don't know about this game in particular, but like fake. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's like the whole, this whole industry of like fake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the safest thing you can collect right now is Nintendo 3DS because they haven't they haven't managed uh, managed to <clears throat> uh, counterfeit those yet to create bootlegs. So. Um, when you buy a 3DS game, it's going to be the real thing. It's kind of there, there. Always seems to be a sweet spot of eras where you can collect the stuff. Not enough people have really gotten into collecting them, and they're still getting rid of their current collections. Right. Got to keep an eye out for those. So you think 3DS is what to? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's going to start sky. I, actually, it's already started going up in price because Nintendo discontinued the 3DS hardware uh, during the pandemic. Actually, so that really kind of coincided with the the price escalation that happened during the pandemic. Um, yeah, I mean, 3DS, there's a lot of good stuff there. 
And uh, right now, you know, a lot of the best stuff is still really cheap, but it, it won't stay that way for long. Like the, the 3DS Pokemon games, you know, once we're another generation in, people are going to start hunting for those. It's just like the DS games. Uh, authentic copies of those have shot to the moon. Uh, like if you want Pokemon Heart Gold with the, uh, the Poke Walker, prepare to uh, take out a second mortgage, basically. Wow. Hey, do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few more. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, you kind of touched on this one already, but they were wondering, uh, what's the value of playing games on original hardware compared to emulation? What's the biggest thing people are missing from the original experience? I mean, these days, emulation is really good. Uh, when I started this, emulation was not that great. But it kind of depends on what you mean by emulation. Like if you're talking about hardware level emulation as opposed to software emulation, I use, you know, emulators or simulators, FPGA based uh, devices like Analog NT Mini, the Mr. FPGA console. Um, those are great. Like, I mean, they're not 100% accurate, but when an FPGA simulation is built well and, you know, vetted by the community and patched and corrected and updated, it's as near as you can get to original hardware as possible. And, you know, the thing about playing on original hardware, especially on a CRT television, is that you're going to get a really, I don't want to say authentic, you're going to get a very seamless experience. There's going to be no lag. There's going to be no, like, input failures or anything like that like the game is just going to feel the way that it did you know 30 years ago it's how the designers created the game you know they didn't have to account for lcd display lag or upscale lag or anything like that they just gave you the game they knew you'd stick it in your console and it would you know flow into a television and you would be playing it a certain way and Like that's that's the thing that really kills me is I'm really, really sensitive to when there's that kind of input or display lag. Like it really it really messes with me and can kind of ruin the experience for me. So that's that's kind of why I stick with har original hardware and CRTs as much as possible, uh, just because for me, it's a more satisfactory experience. But like, honestly, play video games however you want to play them. If you play on an emulator and it doesn't bother you great that's fine if you play one of those terrible sega at game consoles from you know five or six years ago that doesn't even run games at the right speed and the sound is horrible and mm -hmm. you're fine with that okay that's fine stretch one. out stretch out your your graphics to 16 9 whatever it's it's your experience play how you want to play it's great it's just as long as you're enjoying a video game that's what really counts but i will say like if you ever have the opportunity to play an nes game or a genesis game on an actual hardware on a nice television with like s video or you know just good good quality composite it is a different experience and you know there is something to it that's that's kind of special and also you know using original hardware you get you get to experience these kind of edge cases that can mess up emulation. Um, for one thing, you know, like trying to use a Rob game for NES or a light gun game, those aren't going to work on a flat panel TV and emulators can kind of fake it. Like, you know, let you use a mouse or something, but it's not the same as looking down the, you know, the sights of a plastic pistol and blasting tin cans out of the air or something. Uh, it's just, you know, there's, there's, there are those experiences that just can't be recreated or even something like, not that I enjoy them, but the, uh, the power pad games for NES, Ooh, like wow. those games are really obscure aside from, you know, stadium events, just because of its rarity. Exercise mat thing. Yeah. yeah. The exercise mat. Um, like oh, a, wow. a few months ago, I covered uh, a game called um, street cop. I think, wow. I can't, can't remember what it's called. Yeah. Street cop. Uh, and people were like, I've never heard of this game. And that's because there's not really a good way to effectively emulate it. Uh, it's just, it's not the same experience if you're not 
marching on this exercise mat to walk around a street and chase down criminals. Um, yeah, so so there's there's some there's some weird interesting stuff you can do on original hardware that it's just not the same on on emulation. But you know, you start talking about getting into peripherals and things like that. Yeah, like th this game took me a little while to kind of figure out. Um, Are you supposed to be running on that that power pad? Button? Yes, you. It has the worst, most convoluted control scheme. Um, you have to like step on either side of the control pad, and then to rotate and turn, you have to like stand in place and pivot your body and put your foot ahead of the other, and then put the other foot even with it. It's it's just like they they were doing too much with that game it's it's a gigantic mess but you know someone said this is a good idea and then all the way down the release chain you know at nintendo we're like yeah okay sell this to kids it's fine uh that's interesting like why would they do that i think it's just because they really wanted to sell this peripheral and they were like what do kids want to play another exercise game no let's let them be a cop for a while why not Sure, why not? <laughs> Thank God I only have one more of those to do. But again, like using the actual power pad is not something I would be able to do on an emulator. Um, I think the Mister, if you use the snack adapter, it'll let you do that. But you don't exactly have people clamoring to uh, play power pad games. So who knows? There's probably somebody with nostalgia for it. You know, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Someone who had a bad upbringing. No, actually, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that I, I played, I play, I, I covered a video, I produced a video for a game called Dance Aerobics earlier this year, and you would look at that and think like, I don't want to play this. But in trying to be an exercise game using like the 1980s aerobic kind of uh, put on spandex and leg warmers kind of scene, it accidentally becomes an early rhythm game. Which was really interesting. It's like a prelude to DDR yeah. in a very sort of clumsy roundabout way. But you can see like the DNA of, of DDR in uh, dance aerobics. Hmm. So you know stuff like that. It's it's fun to experience. That is really neat. I remember I wrote a chapter about DDR. I didn't even. I have to go, if we ever do another edition of that. I'll have to put in this dance. <laughs> Yeah, I don't necessarily recommend anyone go out and buy a copy of Dance Aerobics and a power pad and get it up and running. It's probably not worth it. But, you know, uh, it's it's just kind of interesting that in trying to come up with interesting premises for games to use for their add-on accessory, they were like, oh, let's let's have a game about dancing to create music. Challenge accepted. Yeah, I'm... Now, hearing you talk about CRTs, I want to say I saw on Twitter or X or whatever they call it these days about it's Twitter. Yeah, it's kind of a demand for CRTs, you know, for, for precisely that purpose. And there's e even some talk, I guess, maybe about making new ones that would be slimmer and easier to to ship because they weigh, they weigh like a ton, right? <laughs> they do. Yeah, I would be interested in seeing someone bring back CRTs. As far as I know, there's only one factory in the world that makes them and it's um, somewhere in China and uh, they're not making high end. It's not like Sony Trinitrons. It's just kind of like little cheap monitors that are probably meant for, you know, security systems that people are too cheap to swap out for, you know, modern equipment. Uh -huh. um, but, but yeah, there's just like vinyl had a resurgence and people started making good turntables again. Mm, yeah. But those are a much easier process. Like creating those is much simpler than creating CRTs because CRTs, they have a lot of toxic components in them. And they're also extremely dangerous. Like there's this thing called a flyback transformer inside. You never want to take off the back of a TV that's plugged in because if you touch the transformer, you probably will die. It's it's like, how were these a thing in everyone's house? It's so wild and unsafe. It's like, you know, old playground equipment, like, you know, just crack open children's heads, that kind of thing. Uh, it was just a different era. But I would be interested in seeing someone come up with something that 
captures the functionality of a CRT without all the toxic chemicals and highly dangerous electronics. Hmm. And, you know, if it weighed less, that'd be great too. Gotta be a way. I think it may be worth contacting that factory to say, hey, do you know there might be a demand for a product? Felt like you already have some of the machinery in place. And right, I got a really kind of anticipated tired gaming dad's question, so I'm sure that's why he was asking about the NT Mini. Uh, and then Miko wants to know what is the weirdest classic game you've ever seen? And then how does the current well, let's just do that one. He's, he's got a second question, but it's not really a follow up. So, what's the weirdest game you've ever seen? The weirdest game I've ever seen. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by weird. But in terms of just like, is this a fever dream? I would have to say Puli Rula by Taito, uh, which is an arcade brawler. It's like a storybook kind of game. It's got these very cute, charming, cartoonish graphics. But every stage is just full of the most unhinged nonsense. It's so bizarre. What's the, how do you spell that? Puli Rula. P U. Now, now you ask, and I. <laughs> uh, oh, is it P P U L I R U L A Puli Rula? Yes. Like, looks like we've got it here. It's got this very sort of charming, um, sort of European style. Um, actually, I think you're pretty much at the end of the game there. This is uh, Luke Morse one. Okay, so this is the weirdest one. Huh? Oh. No, it's it's just the one, first one that comes to yeah. There you go. See, it's that's got all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, that's like true. the enemies are really bizarre. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's there's lots of uh, very strange games out there, but of course you ask me and nothing comes to mind. <laughs> that one that was pretty weird. And then Miko also has a short little question here for you. How does the current state of the industry compare to 30 years ago? Oh, I kind of feel like I answered that already, I feel actually. Like already um, yeah, we have independent game developers. It's, you know, it's not the, the sort of salad days of 10 years ago, but um, you have sort of the, the, the big developers and big publishers uh, racing to price themselves out of existence with really, really expensive game projects. Uh, but then if you look at the sides, there are lots and lots of more creative ventures that can afford to be, you know, take bigger risks and so forth. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's more varied, I would say, and much less about, you know, just a handful of publishers, if you're willing to kind of go off the beaten path. No, I love the Indies. I mean, it's, to me, it's just made, I probably would have given up on gaming. <laughs> you know, but the, the Indies kind of saved it for me. <clears throat> All right. One last question from Matt. Okay. Bradley. Triggy. If you could give, if you could have given yourself a piece of advice at the beginning of your career, based on what you know now, what would it be? Mm, that's a great question. Um don't sell all the games you've been buying. Hang on to them because you'll you'll be able to sell them for a lot more later on. No, actually, it would probably be Pivot to Video. Uh, if I could have beaten Angry Video Game Nerd to the Punch, uh, I'd be a celebrity now. But instead, I'm just this guy. Not just this guy, Jeremy Parrish. Like, like Zay Fab B-Roll Rocks, I'm just this guy, you know? <laughs> well hey thanks for taking the time to be on my channel it's been awesome yeah sure happy to help out or do whatever whatever this is whatever it is that i did uh put in an appearance someplace excellent well i'm gonna check out these books i'm already on the, your, your patreon and your of course podcast and youtube but there's so much more <laughs> well thanks Ken. Good yeah absolutely your, thanks for having me on with your construction or whatever's going on oh yeah thanks uh, i'm looking forward to having a working kitchen again it'll be great yeah that's nice all right thanks again yeah have a good one and that's all for this episode i hope you guys enjoyed that yeah it was really cool getting to talk to jeremy 
you know, I've read a lot of his stuff, seen a lot of his videos, and of course the Retro Knots podcast, but you know, it was a real treat. I never actually got to, to meet him until the uh, this video, so that was really cool. Hope you guys enjoyed it too. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, yes, you, very, very, very much for supporting this show, keeping it on the air, keeping the interviews coming. I got some great stuff in the pipes, including the interview uh, coming up with the uh, developers of Zoria, Age of Shattering, and lots and lots, <laughs> lots more stuff in the pipe. Uh, but none of it will be possible without you and your support. So thank you for that. Uh, I for you have to forgive me for the delays here. Uh, we are in the uh, coming up on finals week here at the university, and that's when the grading tends to pile up. Uh, so I'm trying to stay on top of it, trying to keep everything updated, but uh, the end credits, you know, that, that can take a while to get that stuff uh, uh, sorted out. But I promise you by the next episode, we will have your name in the credits if you are uh, a recent uh, patron or perhaps someone who has upgraded to full retro. Uh, but whatever level of support you're at, I appreciate it. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, and I... <laughs> Uh, I can assure you that Matt Bradley Shergi also thanks you. All right. What about that news from the Matt Cave? What about the news from the Matt Cave? You know, I also have an unboxing for an unwrapping. I don't know quite what to call it. We'll uh, get to that after the news. Uh, all right, Punny, 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 Punny writes in about Capes by Spitfire Interactive. Superheroes clash in this turn-based strategy game. Recruit, train, and deploy your team in order to take back the city from the villains that hold it hostage. Never <laughs> like those villains. Uh, sometimes the villains are more interesting than the, than the superhero. Uh, looks a bit like XCOM. Uh, with a comic book uh, superheroes theme. You know, what was that game back in the day? Uh, not City of Heroes. Uh, uh, Freedom Force? Am I thinking of the right title? Uh, superhero uh, RPG. That was really fun. I should do, I don't know if I, have I done a video on that one? I should uh, definitely cover that if I haven't. But, but anyway, back to <laughs> Capes. <laughs> okay, this is supposed to come out on uh, May 29th, 2024. Uh, so right around the corner. Thank you, Punny. And then Miko uh, writes in about uh, War Tales. War Tales has a new DLC. As you know, I really love War Tales. Thought it was fantastic. I haven't got a chance to try this expansion yet, but it's called, um, uh, well, what is it called? Tavern? <laughs> Didn't actually write down the name of the stupid thing. Uh, but it's a management and simulation expansion for War Tales where you get to run a tavern. Uh, purchase your initial establishment, select the finest decor for the tavern, hire employees, and craft the optimal menu to satisfy your daily customers. Now I'm looking here, I don't see anything about how you add rats to the cellar of the tavern. Uh, so perhaps they have forgotten that pertinent detail. <laughs> I should leave a lengthy and scathing review if they leave out that uh, particular tavern feature but anyway in all seriousness this uh, looks like a lot of fun uh, and there's already a lot of stuff to that game so this adds even more meat to the bone all right then lastly uh, i was looking uh when i was looking at this uh, expansion for war tales uh, you know how steam likes to pop up with a little recommendation and i saw something called slice and dice and i thought this looked pretty cool it's a tactical dice rolling roguelike combat game Take combat of five heroes, or take control of five heroes, each with their own unique dice. Fight your way through 20 levels of monsters and take on the final boss. If you lose a single fight, you have to start over, so be careful. So it's got a free demo or the full game for $8.99, but you know, it's looking at the, it's got overwhelmingly positive reviews and the uh, reviews are really interesting. So I think it's one of those games that looks kind of simple, but <laughs> once you get it, start tinkering around with it. It's like 500 hours have passed and you're still uh, having a good time. So I thought I'd put that out there. You know, if you are playing a Slice and Dice or any of these other games and you got some thoughts on it, uh, please feel free to share those on the YouTube comments. All right, let's do the unboxing. All right, here we go. Ugh. Things that work out in a box. Uh, it's already kind of been gnawed on by some of my own little tavern rats here. It does look like some rats have been at this package. Let's get it open. 
And I think this is going to be a book I ordered from Bitmap, Bitmap Publishing. Now let's open. Can I get it open? We could have used a dagger. Oh yeah, Bitmap. Why can I not say Bitmap? <laughs> Bitmap books. Oh, that's pretty cool. No obvious way. Oh, there we go. Okay. Ah, look. I, I like it when they put a, a little effort into the box. <laughs> so they got kind of a little uh, schmups theme box. You know, it's almost you know, almost a regret to have to damage it to open it. Let's go ahead though, because I got stuff to read in here. Come on. Um, <laughs> I don't want to destroy the box. There we go. Oh, now there's a box within a box. Oh, it's a multi. Okay. <laughs> Things packed like it was uh, explosive or something. All right, I guess we got to open this. All right. Oh wow! Yeah, look at the, look at that. <laughs> oh, all right. This thing is probably going to be absolutely pristine condition. That's some of the best packaging I've ever seen. Yeah, this is a heavy one, and we still got some unwrapping to do. Oh, it's like Christmas paper. Uh, it's just like being 13 again. And there we go. Exactly what I was expecting. This is my guide to Japanese role-playing games. Now, don't tell me they didn't put the author's name on it. <laughs> uh, welcome to the uh, world of Japanese role-playing games. Video role-playing games. Okay, well, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you right now. But seriously, where's the? I mean, I know who wrote it, but how would you know if you did not? Okay, I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> take, take it out of this this plastic. Beautiful cover design, but I think they neglected kind of an important detail. Oh, this thing weighs a ton. Uh, uh, oh, accidentally broke the book. Uh, okay. Wow, this thing is thick. This thing is massive. Yeah, so <laughs> finally we get the author's name here. Of course, it's a Kurt Kalata. I'm surprised it's not on the uh, the book or the spine. But anyway, enough about that. Yeah, look at this thing. Yeah, this is how this is how I would envision if I ever do another uh, Dungeons and Desktops edition. I would love something of this size, <laughs> nice and big, full color. Look at this, just beautiful. Uh, beautiful artwork on this. Yeah, I can't wait to dig in <laughs> and learn. This book is going to be very educative to me because uh, I, you know, I've always focused on CRPGs, and Kurt is pretty much like the uh, uh, the opposite of me, uh, focusing in on the JRPGs instead. So this will be really great. Okay. Anyway, I just thought I would uh, share that unboxing with you. This is a really big book. I mean, it kind of makes Dungeons and Desktops look... <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I guess they're about... No, this his book is a good uh, a good quarter larger than mine. <laughs> I can't have that. Kurt, we can't have that. I've got to... I'm going to have to contact my publisher immediately. We need a much thicker, bigger, heavier... <laughs> uh, okay, enough about this. Um, hopefully you'll get your copy too. All right, what else do I have? Uh, oh yeah, that ale of the week. I could definitely use my ale after all that hard work opening a book. <laughs> uh, and this time I got a little, uh, <clears throat> another little uh, 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 beer from Best Day Brewing, uh, West Coast IPA. Uh, this is born in Northern California. Non-alcoholic. Uh, what else do they say here? Water, barley, hops, and yeast. 68 calories? Okay. <laughs> uh, what I'm curious about their, what their West Coast. Oh, you know, this is, what is with these uh, these non-alcoholics just going to town? It's like all these things have been, 
you know, I feel like every other NA I drink, I have to open over a sink because it just comes spewing out. Uh, really nice hoppy aroma on this. Kind of piney and citrusy. Uh, a little bit of a lemon zest. Good uh, bubbles on that. Of course, it's got a lot of head on it at the moment. <laughs> we had to pour the rest of this into the drinking horn. You know, somebody was saying that uh, YouTube's probably uh, basically shadow banning me because of these ale reviews because they they don't want uh, you know people to see people drinking alcohol. But I don't think they realize that I've switched to non-alcoholic uh, brew. So I shouldn't have any problems, so we will see. Maybe I'll have a sudden spike in popularity, but I'm not holding my <laughs> fingers on that one. Man, you know, it's, it's got a really good aroma to it, kind of a bit of a caramel uh, 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 scent. That's good. You know, you definitely get a little bit of a ho uh, hoppy taste. Um, what else is going on there? Uh, kind of a little bit of a bitterness, kind of a like a lemon zest or orange rind. Uh, uh, bitterness quality to it. Let me try it again here. You know, it's pretty good. Uh, it's it's. I'm gonna switch to the glass before I say anything else because sometimes uh, <laughs> sometimes the horn imparts its own flavor. Uh, so let's go with a little bit here in the glass. Yeah, this one, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this one's okay. Um, you know, it's got that nice hoppy quality to it. Of course, it's got a nice head, nice uh, scent on it. I feel like it's a little bit more noticeable that this is a non-alcoholic <laughs> uh, than those athletic ones that I've been trying. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to describe it exactly, but it's like there's just a little bit of a, I don't know what to call it other than just watery uh, aftertaste. You know, of course, when you're drinking a a regular beer, excuse me, and when you swallow it, you get a little bit of a, a bite, a little bit of heat from the alcohol. And somehow Athletic is able to mimic that somehow. I don't know if it's the type of carbonation they're using, but it's just, I mean, they've, they've nailed it. Uh, whereas this company, uh, it's not that it's bad, you know, it's not like you would say, ugh. <laughs> you know, you could tell it's a beer, but... Uh, I just don't think they're quite as close as that athletic company uh, and really kind of fooling the senses into thinking it's a regular beer. Uh, but anyway, it's definitely not bad. Uh, I would go probably uh, say somewhere between two and three out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, again, just in terms of non-alcoholics, I wouldn't try to compare this to a regular uh, West Coast IPA. But again, if you're looking for something, you just want something kind of beer adjacent <laughs> fancy can we say it that way uh, maybe it's a hot day uh, you don't want the alcohol you're driving somewhere i don't think you'd be disappointed with this okay let's wrap it up with a quotation and i was uh, looking for quotes about uh journalism and i found one from oscar wilde you can always count on oscar wilde <laughs> for a funny quote. It's like funny, but also insightful, actually. It goes something like this. The difference between literature and journalism is that journalism is unreadable and literature is not read. <laughs> I see what I mean? Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that. Now, see you next time.
feet, suckers! Yeah.